uh, recovery. Um, as Dan was saying, um, this is a bit of a, a last minute um, talk, uh, not quite as rushed, I have to say, as um, uh, yesterday um, late afternoon. Um, I suppose it's a bit strange uh, that given the um, 100th um, anniversary of the CPGB, we actually didn't schedule um, such a meeting in the first place. So I think it's an important uh, question and an instructive um, moment in history, not least given the fragmented and um, I'm not saying totally useless uh, left that exists, but a, a left that is not only fragmented, but punches in social terms way, way beyond, um, you know, um, its, its potential. Okay, so my argument is uh, pretty straightforward uh, that the formation of the CPGB 100 years ago uh, over July the 31st, August, the first 1920 was genuinely a significant moment uh, in the history of the working class movement uh, in Britain. But as I'll stress, I don't think it was just a British question. Um, it's true uh, that uh, at its height, uh, the CPGB uh, was a pretty modest party. Um, I think it reached its um, um, how should I put it, biggest membership 43, 44, um, and um, I think it was about 45,000. Uh, and certainly when it was formed, it was quite interesting that if you look at all the organizations that went to form the CPGB, um, you actually ended up with a much smaller organization uh, than what some of the organizations claimed on paper. So the 2,000 or so uh, members um, um, you know, when they actually went and counted what was real and as opposed to what was claimed, i.e. like the SWP, um, was pretty small. Nonetheless, even um, in 1920, um, the formation of the CPGB had a major impact um, and it continued to have uh, a major uh, impact, not only in the 1920s uh, with the Hands Off Russia campaign, um, you know, the fight um, um, around um, uh, the general strike, solidarity uh, with, the, with the miners, good and bad, uh, the CPGB uh, continued to have a very important impact um, on the workers' movement right in uh, to the 1970s um, and in uh, to the 80s. I have to say, you know, by... Uh, the 1980s, the official party's uh, role uh, was um, lamentable, uh, was regressive. Uh, nonetheless, it still had an impact on the Labour Party and on the trade union movement uh, and uh, wider society. Okay, so in terms of um, uh, Europe, um, what we're looking at here in Britain could be described, and I think quite legitimately, um, as the unification um, of sects. Um, so compared with um, Germany, uh, which began as a pretty small party, but then won over the majority of delegates from the um, independent Social Democratic Party in Germany, which made the Communist Party of Germany um, a mass party compared with uh, the majority vote at the um, Congress of the French Workers' Party, uh, the majority vote um, in the Italian Socialist Party, which transformed itself uh, into the Communist Party. The CPGB uh, was a considerably more modest um, affair. But in that sense, uh, given what I just said about the left in today's Britain, uh, this gives it um, a particular relevance uh, for us, because I think what it shows is what today's left could do if it overcame move movementism, if it overcame the bureaucratic straitjacket of uh, most of the confessional sects, if it ceased to 
tail behind um, this or that uh, left reformist career politician, if it actually constituted itself on the basis of uh, clear uh, uh, principles and um, um, healthy um, uh, democracy uh, and combining that uh, with, with debate, um, we could actually transform the situation um, in, in Britain. Okay, um, so what was the significance uh, of the CPGB? First of all, I would argue uh, it's internationalism. Uh, it was not merely a British uh, phenomenon. Um, it was uh, the British section of the Communist International, the British section of the World uh, Communist Party. Um, it had also set its uh, sights on learning from the best. And what that meant is learning from the Bolshevik party, which of course had made the uh, October revolution and the CPGB adopted as axiomatic uh, the idea of Soviets, uh, the idea of the dictatorship of the proletariat uh, and the idea of uh, democratic uh, uh, centralism. Um, so th this was the significance of it. Also, I think, um, again, its significance, just to make the point once more, uh, is that this was the result not simply of fusion, uh, but a whole series of splits and fusions going back uh, a considerable way. I suppose the real story of the CPGB begins uh, with the formation of the Social Democratic Federation. Um, I think its first name was Democratic Federation. It, it had a number of other different names, but we call it the SDF uh, for the sake of convenience for the moment. It was founded uh, by a rather strange guy, Henry Heinemann. Um, he was uh, rich um, and um, previously, I think he'd been a Tory. Um, either way, I think the story is that um, he was traveling over the Atlantic. I don't know which way, whether it was to America or from America. Um, and uh, he had a copy of the Communist Manifesto. He read it uh, and that won him uh, to uh, what he thought was Marxism. I've also heard the story that it was capital. Uh, doesn't really matter. The point would be uh, that um, uh, this changed his outlook. Uh, and he decided uh, to finance um, the setting up uh, of the SDF, which is uh, Britain's first formerly Marxist um, organization. So he financed uh, the SDF, he financed the paper Justice. Uh, he also wrote a book called um, England uh, for All. Um, and it has to be said, uh, that uh, there was two chapters in it. I've not read it, I have to confess. There were two chapters in it uh, that Marx was particularly infuriated by uh, because um, it smacked to him of plagiarism, and I'm sure that's right. It, it also should be stressed that uh, when uh, Marx and Henry met, um, they didn't strike it off. Uh, Marx didn't have a high opinion of uh, Henry Heinemann. And although he never met him, uh, the same has to be said of uh, Frederick um, Engels. If you read Frederick Engels on the SDF, in general, he's pretty uh, contemptuous. Having said that, um, uh, let's just list out some of the members of the SDF as, as opposed to just Henry Heinemann. And it's true that these people leave. Nonetheless, you will have heard of them. William Morris, George Lansbury, James Connolly, uh, Edward Aveling, Eleanor Marx, and you can carry on with various trade union leaders um, and uh, various other uh, individuals. So Engels, of course, thought uh, that what Hyman had in mind and what he was, uh, all that he was capable of doing was uh, producing a sect. I think when we look at the later evolution or development of the SDF, um, I think you would have to say that that isn't, that's a too one sided uh, uh, judgment um, on the SDF. Anyway, let's just tell uh, the story of Henry Hyman. Um, 
uh, he was uh, um, more than willing, uh, and indeed he did it, uh, to make deals with the Tories from, from his point of view, uh, looking at the working class movement in the late 19th century. Uh, the working class movement in Britain had trade unionism amongst skilled workers. Uh, that was a, a strong uh, position. Uh, there were developments towards mass trade unionism amongst unskilled uh, workers. Uh, but from Henry Hyman's point of view, uh, what was crucial is splitting the working class movement from being the tail um, of the Liberal Party. And towards that end, he was actually prepared to do deals um, um, uh, with the Liberals, uh, with the Tories against the Liberals. So there was an incident in Hampstead and... Um, um, Kentish Town constituency. Remember that th this is a, a time when the suffrage is um, very limited, but he, he actually did a deal with the Tories uh, in Hampstead and Kentish Town to stand an SDF candidate um, in order to take votes away from the Liberals. He was quite prepared to let the Tories in. Has to be said that the candidate of the SDF didn't do well, but the candidate was financed, as I understand it, uh, with a, a 50 quid uh, Tory uh, donation. Um, uh, talking about trade unionism, um, Henry Hyman was no fan of strikes. Uh, he viewed them as uh, disruptive, as a diversion uh, from the education of the working class. So the working class was to be taught socialism in a very propagandist, uh, bookish, schoolroomish uh, way. Uh, strikes, uh, industrial action, learning uh, um, from experience about collective strength uh, was something he frowned upon or, or actually uh, dismissed. Um, it's true that when uh, Britain um, involved itself in um, extending its um, Southern Africa um, empire by basically declaring wars and seeking to annex uh, the Boer republics, uh, that he uh, did not side uh, with British uh, imperialism, but again, showing his rather peculiar uh, version of socialism, he was able to uh, not side with British imperialism by explaining the Boer War um, through uh, Jewish money, Jewish influence. Um, and it has to be said uh, that in terms of the SDF, I haven't read everything, but I have read criticisms of that, both in Justice uh, and uh, elsewhere, uh, from people like Theodore Rothstein, that's the father for those that are old enough, of Andrew the Roth Rothstein. I think Theodore was actually a Menshevik. Uh, he became a Bolshevik uh, later. He's famous uh, for writing a very good book called From Chartism uh, to Laborism. It really is required reading. Anyway, Theodore Rothstein uh, objected to um, Henry Hyman's anti-Semitism. So did someone called Zelda Khan. Again, for the older comrades um, who are listening, they might remember a Zelda Curtis. He was, or she was, um, the Robbie Ricks um, of the um, Morning Star. Uh, she was the fund uh, um, driver uh, for the Morning Star. Uh, but she was a very prominent member uh, of the SDF. And uh, those, of course, who were objecting to Heinemann's um, anti-Semitism weren't just a couple of individuals. Uh, it should be emphasized that the SDF had a real base uh, amongst some workers in the northern towns, northern industrial towns of England, but also it had a substantial base uh, in the East End of London uh, amongst uh, Jewish workers. But the, the attitude uh, towards Henry Hyman's anti-Semitism is interesting for us and I think instructive to us because they basically thought this is, a, this is an old fashioned uh, uh, view, a rather peculiar view that should be treated with some condescension. Uh, that was the attitude. Remember that th this is uh, pre-Holocaust um, and um, uh, all the rest of it. So this was viewed as rather eccentric, rather peculiar, rather primitive. So we should view it in 
that way. Nonetheless, it's clear that, that if we take the left, uh, there was definitely an anti-Semitism. You could find it in the trade union movement. You could certainly find it amongst the Fabians and uh, the leaders of the Labour Party. Uh, and you can find it um, in Europe uh, amongst the um, anarchist followers of Bakunin um, and the anarchist followers of uh, Proudhon. So it did exist. It's not something that we can say uh, that anti-Semitism uh, is simply an ideology um, of the right. Um, there is a definite anti-Semitic strand uh, in terms of um, socialism in the late 19th century too. Okay, so given Henry Hyman's uh, um, rather strange politics, but also given his um, almost ownership um, of the SDF, it's not surprising uh, that the, S uh, that the um, Social Democratic Federation led to a series of splits and walkouts. Sometimes this was a, an individual sort uh, uh, in other uh, um, in instances, it took an organized form. The Socialist League was established in 1884. That cons consisted of um, um, Eleanor Marx, Edward Aveling, William Morris and others. Has to be said, though, uh, that that organization didn't thrive, didn't uh, flourish in spite of um, Engels's uh, hopes uh, uh, for it. We also saw uh, the Socialist Labour Party uh, split uh, in 1903. Uh, these were people very orientated to the industrial uh, struggle, uh, and they basically adopted the ideas of Daniel de Leon in the United States. You could describe their outlook as uh, syndicalistic, um, and they combined that syndicalism uh, with the sort of uh, book learning um, that characterized Hyman, i.e. the working class need to be sat down and educated uh, in uh, socialism. There was also a split that's still around, uh, the Socialist Party of Great Britain, 1904. Um, it was um, anti-industrial um, action. Um, it was also opposed, bitterly opposed to um, uh, the Labour Party. Nonetheless, uh, uh, in spite of these splits, in spite of the autocratic style uh, of its labor uh, dictator, uh, the um, SDF grew. And in 1911, uh, there was a, a, a unity uh, conference uh, which united the SDF uh, with the independent Labour Party left. Just a little note on the independent Labour Party. This was an organization led by people like Keir Hardy, um, Ramsey MacDonald. Um, it tended to be dominated by a sort of ethical um, uh, socialism. And it's also just worth mentioning uh, that if you read Lenin, uh, every time he mentions the independent Labour Party, he always puts, I say always, often puts in brackets after the word independent with a ha ha ha. Uh, or a sneer. Um, he didn't view the independent Labour Party as being independent from bourgeois um, uh, ideas. Uh, he viewed it uh, also as an organisation uh, that was more than willing uh, to act as the parliamentary tail uh, um, of uh, the Liberal Party uh, if it found parliamentary. Uh, representation, which it began to do um, with the formation um, of the Labour Party. In terms of the Labour Party electing MPs, they basically were of two types, trade union uh, leaders and members of uh, the independent uh, Labour Party. So in 1911, given the perceived, the widely perceived failure actually at the time of the Labour Party in Parliament, uh, the, uh, um, the left of the ILP merged uh, with the SDF, and they also merged with supporters of uh, the publication called The Clarion and a load of local groups. Throughout this whole period, uh, we shouldn't just imagine um, single national groups. Uh, there were countless um, examples of local groups 
that were formed around one particular um, a nuance or, or another. Um, obviously, they rejected the national organizations for one reason or another, but plenty of them um, existed. So again, very similar uh, to the situation today. So out of this merger in 1911 came the British Socialist uh, Party. Um, just worthwhile mentioning um, um, in terms of uh, the Labour Party, uh, that the SDF um, was a component part of the Labour Party in terms of its formation. Uh, when the Labour Party was established, uh, the trade unions were given um, seats on its National Executive Committee, and I'm just making up the numbers, but say there were 10 uh, trade union representatives. Um, the SDF was given two, uh, the ILP was given two, and uh, the Fabians were given one. And if, again, if you read the documents of the time, uh, it's clear that the founders of the Labour Party valued um, uh, the SDF and the ILP because they brought with them ideas. Uh, they didn't bring huge numbers, uh, but they, they, they had, um, how should you put it, um, uh, an intellectual uh, vigour. They had an ideological strength uh, that was very valued. It has to also be said uh, that because the um, uh, embryonic Labour Party didn't accept the class war, the class struggle, uh, the SDF walked out. Um, so, um, so the reason I've sort of um, taken that uh, backtrack uh, is to note that the BSP affiliates to the Labour Party uh, in 1916. Uh, again, 1916 uh, will come to um, um, really through um, the attitude of the BSP uh, to World War uh, One. Um, okay, World War One uh, breaks out. What does Henry Heim? What's his response to it? Well, his response to it is, "I'm in solidarity um, with my comrades Rosa Luxemburg, Karl Liebknecht." Um, Edward Bernstein, um, um, Mehring. Uh, these are the people he's in solidarity with uh, because these people uh, are against uh, the war in Germany. Uh, he attacks uh, Prussian militarism and, yes, you already guessed it, sides with uh, 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 Britain. Um, I actually got a book by him, Henry Hyman, from 1915, and it's interesting not only uh, because he's siding with his uh, German comrades who are fighting Prussian militarism. Uh, but in terms of my little talk yesterday, worthwhile noting, he's got a whole chapter on the armed nation and uh, was making the point that if we'd gone for the armed nation, uh, then World War I uh, wouldn't have happened, couldn't have happened, because you would have had a militia system, you would have had the election of officers and all the rest of it. But in Easter 1916, um, the opposition faction, which had been publishing a rival publication to justice, it was called The Call, uh, won the Congress. And, um, you know, um, this is riding um, on a wave of anti-war sentiment, but it's also rooted uh, in the resolutions um, of the Second International. Uh, these people are coming from a second international position. And what you've got, I've already mentioned one of them, Zelda Kahn, uh, took a, a leading role uh, in the victory over Heinemann. So did a guy called Alfred Impkin and Alf Watts and others that went on to become leading members of the CPGB. Now, we don't want to get carried away with where their ideological position was. Uh, I think you could describe their approach as social pacifistic. Uh, they adhered to the uh, decisions of the Zimmerwald um, um, uh, Congress, the Zimmerwald Conference of September 1915 and its manifesto, as written uh, by Leon Trotsky, but opposed by Lenin. The Bolsheviks sign up to it. Uh, but they register their opposition. Lenin's slogan, you all know, 
uh, turn the imperialist war into civil war, revolutionary defeatism. Don't side uh, with your own ruling class. Use this as an opportunity to overthrow the ruling class. Trotsky's position uh, was much more along the lines of a just peace, no annexations. Um, and that was the position of what became uh, the British Socialist Party majority. Uh, again, a little footnote for amusement's uh, sake, I think. Um, Heinemann walks out under these circumstances and after a short period of time forms what would now be an unfortunate name, the National Socialist Party. Again, it's interesting, according my um, um, Henry Heinemann book from 1915, not only does he talk about his solidarity with his German uh, comrades and um, uh, the armed nation, he also announces his conversion uh, to the idea uh, that the revolution, that the socialist transition would first of all begin in um, a w one country. Uh, so this is quite interesting, I think, for debates about socialism in one country. In 1915, he announces that he's changed his mind um, on this question. It doesn't mean he doesn't think socialism is international, uh, but he, he, he now thinks uh, that socialism will happen first of all in one country, then another country, then another. Uh, country. So I think that's just an interesting uh, aside. Okay, so in 1919, we all know the story, the Russian Revolution has happened. Uh, we all know the April thesis. Lenin says that the old international is dead. We need a new international. That is something that the Bolsheviks have been saying, I think, more or less since the beginning of uh, uh, World War I. But of course, now with the authority of uh, having won the revolution, having overthrown the provisional government, having announced all power uh, to the Soviets, they're able uh, to actually make moves uh, to make the Third International a reality. Uh, it's again just worthwhile bearing in mind uh, that it wasn't as simple as declaring a Congress and then people either get you know, on, a, on an aircraft and fly off uh, to Moscow or Petrograd. It was very difficult uh, to get to Soviet Russia. And that was true not only for the first founding Congress of the Comintern, that was true also for the second Congress of Comintern. I've got a book on my bookshelf uh, by Willie Gallagher, and he describes the um, sea journey uh, that he and Sylvia Pankhurst had to make to get to Russia uh, that ends with a, a sleigh journey, uh, um, I think, through Norway uh, and then into uh, Russia. Uh, it was a real ad adventure. It wasn't straightforward. Uh, um, you know, um, we've got to remember that there, there was a, a civil war in Russia. And in that sense, you know, World War I really didn't come to an end. Uh, in many parts of Europe in November 1918. Uh, it continued with the Russian-Polish War. It continued uh, in the Balkans. It continued in Finland. Anyway, the point would be uh, that with the call uh, for a new international by the Soviet government uh, now in uh, um, Petrograd stroke Moscow, um, we had various organizations in Britain um, saying that they're up uh, uh, for this project of uh, the Third International and forming a Communist Party. That included uh, the BSP. The BSP actually was the core uh, of this uh, move, but it also included the Socialist Labour Party, the Workers' Socialist Federation, the South Wales Socialist Society, um, elements in the ILP, the Shop Stewards Movement, um, and a lot of local um, socialist societies scattered here, there, and more or less um, uh, everywhere. Just a little note on the Workers' Socialist Federation. In many ways, the Workers' Socialist Federation had similarities with the SDF. This was the organization, I think you can say, of Sylvia Pankhurst, uh, the daughter, uh, of course, of the um, 
uh, Pankhurst family, famous for the women's so political and social union, you know, the feminist uh, movement demanding, uh, well, votes for women. Uh, what is significant about Sylvia is she's saying universal suffrage, uh, not just equal votes for men and women, i.e. votes for middle class women, votes for workers uh, of whatever gender. That was her slogan. And she initially established the women's social uh, federation, socialist, was it women's socialist federation? I think it was women's socialist federation in the east end of London, um, where her sister uh, Christabel was increasingly becoming a terroristic and anti-male um, as such. Uh, Sylvia Pankhurst was for the unity of men and women um, and uh, emphasized not bourgeois respectable women and their demand for the vote, but working class uh, uh, women. Um, in terms of the paper, uh, if you look at uh, the workers dreadnought, lovely name, isn't it? Uh, it's actually a very good paper, much better paper than the call, a much better paper than the SLP's paper, the socialist. She could write very well. And also she was very well informed about politics in Europe. Uh, it really is uh, an, an excellent uh, paper. But again, uh, it was run very much along the lines of justice. In effect, she owned it. And in effect, she owned uh, the um, uh, WSF, uh, which became later <laughs> absurdly named Communist Party, British section of the um, Communist um, International. Um, having mentioned the Second Congress and Sylvia Pankhurst and Willie Gallagher. Willie Gallagher, by the way, was uh, the leader of uh, the shop stewards movement in Scotland, um, ended up, well, ended up, yeah, he ended up uh, becoming a communist MP um, in Scotland um, in the 20s and also again um, in the 1940s. Um, anyway, uh, they, they both go to Moscow. They both have meetings with Lenin. Uh, this is Lenin, who's just published uh, Left Wing Communism. All delegates are given a copy. Uh, Willie Gallagher described, bloody hell, uh, I mentioned by this, this guy, Lenin. Uh, he was completely flabbergasted by it. Uh, but Lenin um, discusses with Gallagher the key questions um, of Labour Party affiliation and standing in elections. Uh, Gallagher promises to go away and think about it, but commit himself uh, to the process of forming a communist party. Um, Silver Pankhurst was not convinced and goes away and tries to form some left wing um, alliance uh, with the SLP and um, co-thinkers in Holland um, and in, in Germany, which really comes uh, to, to nothing. So um, what we have um, um, is a series of negotiations, but also a series of failed negotiations. But that leads to a split in the Socialist Labour Party. The best elements form the Communist Unity Group. They are given a, uh, a page in the call. Uh, it's good stuff, worthwhile reading. Uh, these people are against Labour Party affiliation. They don't have any problem particularly uh, with standing in Parliament, unlike Sylvia Pankhurst um, and um, the shop stewards uh, uh, movement. Anyway, uh, this comes to fruition um, July the 31st, August the 30, uh, August the 1st. Uh, they have two main debates. The first debate on standing for parliament is more or less a proxy uh, debate. You know, Pankhurst isn't there. The shop stewards movement isn't there. This is a merger in effect between the BSP and the Communist Unity Group. And no surprise when it comes to standing in elections. This is something that Lenin was stressing um, in terms of left wing communism. The Bolsheviks were often known in Europe as boycottists. And he's explaining no, no, no. Um, in general, we stood, even though the Tsarist Duma was shit and anti-democratic. We used it. You should use it. You shouldn't 
uh, worry about whether it's democratic or not, use it uh, to get uh, to the masses. So the vote amongst the delegates was 186 to 19. When it came to the Labour Party, it was a very different picture. Um, it's interesting to note uh, that the organizers of the um, Unity Convention actually gave uh, the anti uh, Labour Party affiliation um, section uh, more speakers, more time uh, for their position. I have to say uh, that they must have been surprised. I'm rather surprised how narrow the vote was, but it was 100 uh, to 85. Um, remember that the BSP was already affiliated to the Labour Party. It affiliated to the Labour Party after the overthrow of Henry Hyman uh, under uh, the new leadership. The Labour Party accepted it. This is in the middle, yes, uh, of World War I. In spite of the uh, BSP's objections um, and fight uh, against um, uh, not only wartime measures, but the nature of the war, they were accepted uh, as an affiliate. So um, in terms of the new found, newly found Communist Party, it's significant uh, that the Labour Party rudely turns down uh, the new CPGB. You could have um, perhaps um, uh, employed the tactic of saying uh, that the BSP has changed its name. But remember, in terms of their outlook, affiliation was a short-term tactic. Uh, this wasn't a strategic uh, view. It wasn't a long-term view. Um, they were basically following Lenin's argument. And that is, if they allow you to affiliate, good, because this gives you an audience. On the other hand, if they turn you down, it's no nothing to worry about. This will expose them in the eyes of advanced workers. And having been turned down, uh, the Communist Party did conduct a very interesting struggle, not only vis-a-vis -vis affiliation, but the moves that the Labour bureaucracy took to force out now individual members of the Communist Party, uh, bar um, um, individual members of the Communist Party standing as Labour candidates. And indeed, it's worth noting that although the first MP of the Communist Party was actually a defector from the Liberal Party, a guy called, was he Lieutenant Colonel Strange Malone? Uh, that was their first MP. But the other MPs that they had, such as Sattler Vala and I think Newbold, uh, were first of all elected as either communist Labour or as Labour MPs. And what you had is a protracted struggle uh, by the Labour bureaucracy uh, to force the communists out. Now that goes against, we should understand, uh, the original idea and claims of the Labour Party to be an organisation that unites all strands uh, of the Labour movement, the co-ops, um, the trade unions, uh, but also the political parties of the working class. And as the communists said, when they were turned down, um, when the Labour Party started to say, well, but you're loyal to Moscow, you're loyal uh, to um, a th the Third International, they said, well, what about the ILP, the Independent Labour Party? That is an affiliate. And that affiliated to the so-called second and a half international, those that stood uh, um, supposedly um, in the, uh, as, as a continuity uh, with the principles um, of uh, the second uh, international, uh, but supposedly uh, rejected the dictatorship and uh, the terrorism um, of uh, the Bolsheviks. Of course, we know the history of the second and a half international. It ends up collapsing. It ends up uh, rejoining the newly formed socialist um, international. OK, now in terms of unity, uh, it isn't all over because what we have is another uh, unity uh, convention, another unity congress in January 1921. And what that brings uh, um, to it is the Communist Labour Party. This is the organization of Willie Gallagher and the shop stewards movement um, in Scotland. It also brings 
the Communist Party, Britain's British section of the Third International. I don't know what Sylvia Pankhurst was doing at the time, but I, she was in and out of prison, um, not only because of her um, um, fight around the suffrage question, uh, but also because of hands off Russia and uh, other such uh, issues. Either way, the majority break uh, with her and join the CPGB in 1921. And we also have at that Congress, the left wing of the ILP. And they say, well, we're not going to join quite yet uh, because we're hoping that the ILP actually affiliates uh, to the Third International. The ILP uh, did go off and talk to Comintern um, uh, amongst the rank and file. There was clearly a sentiment uh, that was not only sympathetic to the Russian Revolution, uh, but was sympathetic to the politics of Comintern. That failed at the March 1921 ILP Congress. The, the left was marginalized and it walked. Uh, and uh, these people, yeah, um, um, joined the CPGB. I think that included, but I could be wrong, um, um, Palm Dutt, um, who became a leading CPGB figure along with Harry Pollitt uh, in the mid uh, 1920s. Now, okay, let's just round off. What's the time? 53. So, yeah, I've spoken long enough, I think. But let me just emphasize this, that in terms of these unifications and splits, uh, we need to appreciate the difficulties that that involved. Many of the comrades in the BSP would have looked at uh, people in um, the Workers' Socialist Federation and the uh, SLP as sort of headbanging crazies in the same, on the same, by the same measure. People in the WSF, you know, the British section of the Third International, um, would have looked at the BSP and described them as right-wing uh, communists. That was uh, the term that Sylvia Pankhurst used because they want to stand in Parliament. We all know about Parliament. It's corrupting. Just look at the Labour Party. Look at Ramsay MacDonald. Look at these uh, horrible people. Uh, look at uh, um, um, uh, their willingness to affiliate uh, to the Labour Party. So there were, you know, there were real uh, um, emotional factors involved um, in this uh, unification. Just to emphasise, and I think I've already illustrated it, this is against James Klugman. He was the sort of official antiquarian of the Communist Party. He wrote two volumes. He couldn't get to the third. It was too embarrassing. But the early history of the Communist Party, the formation and the general strike, he couldn't get into the third period and the late 20s. It was just too difficult for him. But he says in no sense was the CPGB a foreign creation. Now, this is uh, being put into his text not because that was true. It wasn't true. I think it was a profoundly internationalist um, organization, but because in the 1930s, under the influence of um, um, late common turn, you know, Georgi Dimitrov, uh, the world communist movement took a nationalist turn and they took a turn uh, to align themselves with not only elements in the labor movement, but beyond that uh, to so-called progressive sections uh, of the bourgeoisie. Um, and that, I suppose, culminated in programmatic terms in the British road to socialism, which it should be emphasized. Uh, Harry Pollitt, the general secretary of the Communist Party, went to Moscow and spoke to Joseph Stalin uh, about and the fingerprints on the British road to socialism from Joseph Stalin um, are undoubtedly uh, there. He was um, um, in no small measure uh, the author of the British road uh, to socialism. And what you get there is um, a Labour government with communists um, in it making the transition um, um, with no overthrow to, throw of the state, with the existing army, with the existing um, legal structure, that can go all the way to socialism. The justification uh, for it was the growing strength of the labor movement in the West, uh, the growth of uh, the socialist countries, so-called China, Soviet Union, Eastern Europe, 
and also uh, the movement for colonial liberation, what we would now call national liberation uh, uh, movements. Um, either way, that was a national road and therefore the rewriting of the history of the CPGB. Okay, so um, let's just draw that together. The formation of the CPGB did not begin where people were at. Old ideas of syndicalism, old ideas of social pacifism, old ideas of um, sectarian uh, dogmatism, those ideas had to uh, be overcome. So this was not an attempt to construct a lowest con common denominator broad party. Far from it. This was a party established on the principles of the Second Congress of Comintern uh, and the 21 uh, uh, conditions. Not crazy conditions, not crazy uh, principles, not a crazy um, uh, strategy, but a realistic strategy uh, given the time uh, given the times uh, of actually winning uh, uh, socialism on a global uh, basis. It has to be said uh, that there was some uh, copying of uh, Bolshevism. Um, Bolshevism, of course, copied uh, uh, the German Social Democratic Party, including its Erfurt program. has to be said that the CPGB um, uh, did do some copying, both of a healthy sort, but also of a how should you put it, um, a, a rather unthinking uh, sort. Um, nonetheless, given the times, uh, this was a realistic strategy. Um, okay. Um, ba, ba, ba. Okay, just lastly then, um, what I would argue is that uh, the question of party is the main question today. Um, to use one of Lenin's phrase, phrases, uh, it, it's the links of the chain uh, that we must grasp and uh, put together. And without solving uh, the Communist Party question, without equipping the working class uh, with either uh, a significant uh, Communist Party that then becomes a mass Communist Party, there can be nothing serious, nothing decisive uh, done in terms of the transition to socialism, uh, the overthrow. Uh, of capitalism, or for that matter, even uh, transforming uh, the trade union movement um, and uh, the Labour Party. So the Communist Party uh, today in 2020 is the main question uh, for communists uh, in Britain, and I would also argue um, in other countries uh, of uh, the world. Okay, thanks, Jack, for an interesting and detailed talk there. Um, if uh, people could start to indicate if they would like to speak, you just push the, you're being made into panelists now. You just um, hit the uh, raise hand icon or write your name in the chat box on the right hand side and I'll call you. I'll take I'll take uh, Ephraim first. Hello, good morning. Uh, thanks again, Jack. Um, I guess you know to, to kick it off, I'd like to get you to just expand a bit more on the on the lessons for today point, um, which you know was kind of the last minute um, of the talk. I, you know, I think it's true that um, I, I thought for a minute you were going to quote Trotsky there, you know, without a party, over a party, under a party, <laughs> uh, the thing can't be done. Um, so, um, but so if the lesson today is that we need a mass socialist party or a mass communist party, then okay. 
it felt like the point was going to be what are the lessons for what that means today in terms of how to overcome the current decrepit state of the left, which you began by mentioning. Um, and, you know, you, you said at the start, I don't think it's totally useless, but, you know, to follow through on your final point, if actually based on your final point, it is totally useless. Um, and you kind of alluded maybe to one possibility, which is the, the, the form of, you kind of analogized the, for, the state of the British left around the first few years of the 20th century to its current state today, right? You analogize local groups like the South Wales Socialist Group to, I don't know, like the SWP today or something, right? That there were small groups that had nuances and that, the you know, that this kind of, uh, some kind of unity on a new basis um, is possible. So I'm, you know, I see you're shaking your head. I'm just trying to push you to expand on the lessons today in that sense, beyond the kind of obvious point of without a party, you know, nothing's done. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, got one speaker down. Uh, Mike McNair, please. If you Mike, talk next. Um, I'm gonna, I think also the same issue in slightly different uh, angle on it. Um, the, 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 the st you, you started uh, rightly and inevitably with Heinemann and the SDF. Uh, but it's also the case that we have to start with what, what lies behind uh, the SDF's choices. And um, this is, in essence, Marx's argument, which is shared, in fact, by Marx and the Eisenachers and LaSalle and the LaSalleans. And that is that the working class can't obtain what it needs by uh, pure trade unionism or by constructing cooperatives. LaSalle was first for, for cooperatives. He, want, he wanted state backing for cooperatives, but in order to achieve what it needs, the working class needed to take political action. And that meant uh, conducting campaigns for uh, reform of the laws uh, and intervening at the level of high politics. And similarly, in relation to the first international uh, the task which was posed of, was of the working class uh, forming its own foreign policy, its own international policy, its own, it, it, the, the first international was launched on the back of uh, the uh, successful campaign against British intervention on the side of the South in the American Civil War, and with a view to European wide campaigning uh, of the uh, uh, of the working class in favour of independence for Poland. And there's one of the, we have, among other things, Engels writing on the importance of uh, the British workers' movement campaigning for independence for Ireland, um, uh, uh, or supporting the Irish, not exactly campaigning for independence for Ireland, but supporting the Irish, Irish national movement. If we ask the question why that is the case, you know, because this is, in a sense, we have the, the logic of this, all of these organizations of the, uh, of the Second International, Bolshevism included. Bakunin made the uh, criticism in his criticism of the Eisenach program of the Eisenach socialists in 1869. All the German socialists, he says, believe that the political revolution has to come before the social revolution. But on the contrary, we believe the social revolution has to come first. You have to overthrow the state, institute uh, uh, cooperation uh, uh, without the state. Um, <coughs> and so all of these second international groups, and they, they live within, and the, the, the SDF is a part of it. The ILP is not a part of it. The ILP, you said, is a... Um, uh, uh, ethical social. It's actually Christian. More precisely, it's a Christian socialist organization linked, in particular, to Methodism, um, but basically Christian socialist in 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 character. Um, 
so why is it important? And the answer is actually because uh, without uh, class political independence, uh, the bourgeoisie's intervention, the capitalist class's interventions into the workers' movement simply turn the workers' movement into a political tale, either into a political tale of uh, the nationalist patriarchalist wing of the capitalist class. And that was Marx's objection to La Salle playing fo footsie with uh, Bismarck in Germany and using saying that the, the workers' movement should oppose the liberals and therefore should uh, play footsie with Bismarck. And similarly, that's actually Marx's objection to Hindman more than anything else is the uh, playing footsie with the Tories in order to get independence, which you referred to from the Liberals. But equally, and this was the, the difficulty that Marx and Engels faced in Germany uh, in the 1860s, the Eisenachers were doing the same thing on the other side. They were engaged in entry in the Saxon Liberal Party. Uh, they were a, a trend within the Saxon Liberal Party. It was the Vassalians who brought them out of that to the idea of working class political independence. So you see, similarly, you know, it does the, is the working class simply going to uh, 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 pursue a policy which backs the Liberals or is it a policy which backs the Tories? We've got this in present day, exactly what we have in present day politics. Yeah. We have uh, uh, on Syria uh, trends in the workers' movement uh, which back the policy of uh, the Ba'ath regime and the Iranian Islamic the alliance of the Ba'ath regime and the Iranian Islamic Republic on the ground that what's going on is a um, uh, uh, an imperialist intervention in Syria, which undoubtedly it is a prox imperialist intervention in Syria through the Gulf states and Saudi backing Islamist proxies in Syria. Yeah. But on the other hand, we've also got the people who are saying, um, oh, it's a Syrian revolution, and uh, which it certainly started out as a Syrian revolution, and therefore we still have to defend whatever remains in the Syrian revolution. But equally, in, in relation to the UK, we have um, people saying uh, we have to back Brexit because there's a big working, there is big working class, there certainly is big working class support for Brexit and uh, 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 the nationalist wing is advocating democracy against, in this case, the anti-democratic liberals. Mm -hmm. Or on the other hand, we have to back the EU. And then the surprising feature of this is for the Alliance for Workers' Liberty for um, a whole load of other organisations, the consequence of we have to defend the EU because we're internationalists, is you start going all quiet about the anti-democratic characteristics of the EU, about the fact that the EU is busy drowning migrants in the Mediterranean and uh, uh, locking them up in uh, concentration camps in uh, uh, Greece and Turkey and uh, so on, because it's more important to defend the EU. In both cases, what we're concerned with is tailing uh, the bourgeoisie. And then back to the issue of the anti-Semitism campaign, um, what we've got is a problem which is more general and which is connected with this business of tailing one side of the bourgeoisie or the other. We don't have an independent working class media the capitalist media is not profit making apart from the fact that it is subsidized through advertising supplied by capital. Mm -hmm. The working class in order to have a media needs to subsidize its media. It needs to, it can't be the case. It cannot expect that working class media can run on the basis of profitability. Mm -hmm. We do this every, you know, we have the Robbie Ricks column. This is, it's, it's not a, um, uh, a, a, a trivial thing. It's a fundamental fact that the uh, working class media depends on the working class movement raising funds in order to run it. And then the consequence of this, that the multiple sects competing with each other mm -hmm. Uh, produces uh, ineffective, it, it's, it's, it's fine as far as what you're doing is strike support work, though it's, my God, it's not terribly useful to have a whole load of different people 
uh, doing different strike support work or stuff like that, or single issue campaigns and stuff like that. Fine, colourful, diversity and so on and so forth. But in terms of actually promoting uh, media, which is going to uh, be a worker's voice against the uh, capitalist media, or in terms of promoting uh, political intervention um, at the level of high politics, or in terms of converting the mass movement, which we saw against the Iraq war into the uh, into a, a, a long term consequence and not just letting it wither away. Yeah? What you need is a party and you need a unified party and a party which raises funds and organizes for the purposes of media and a party which intervenes as far as possible in high politics, in elections, etc, etc, etc. And that is the case. It is the case that there is a change which is created by virtue of the formation of the Communist Party, which is the same change in point of fact, which is created as a result of the 1875 fusion of the um, La Salians and the Eisenachers in Germany. And the same change which is created for a period of time when Rifondazione Communista uh, fuses with Democrazia Proletaria uh, and lets uh, the left into their organisation, and which is created for a time by the Scottish Socialist Party, and which is created for a time by uh, uh, um, uh, the Brazilian Workers' Party. The, 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 the process of, there's a snowball effect of unity, which can be, is usually wasted. It's usually wasted because comrades are not committed to uh, unity on the basis of the basic ideas of Marxism. And then they create something which just turns into a dead end. But nonetheless, the, the CP, the foundation of the CP is also an example of that. The, the political impact of the CPGP was substantially larger than of the old BSP and the Workers' Socialist Federation and the South Wales Socialist Federation and the SLP and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all put together. That's it. Okay, thank you. Can I have Marcus Strom next, please? Marcus. Thanks, Daniel. Um, my question is really about uh, the history of the formation of the CPGB was only possible because of the prestige of the Bolshevik revolution. And I think John, your um, history there showed the difficulty of bringing all those disparate groups together, even under the authority of 1917. No such global example currently exists. So how is a strategy of trying to get ragtag Marxist groupoids together, practical or relevant, uh, given that nothing like 1917 uh, exists in the current historical period. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jim Cook, please. Jim Cook. Um, I partly wanted to come in to fill a bit of space before everybody started uh, pouring in, which I think they are now. But one of the things... Uh, I'd like to, to say is uh, my admiration of the current CPGB, which uh, if we had more faces here, we'd perhaps see a lot of blushes on one side and shaking heads on the other. But to partly, it's because I was in the Workers' Revolutionary Party for a long time, a very different organization altogether then and now, I believe. Um, there's this, well-known thing in communist circles of criticism and self-criticism. And in the CPGB, you can actually uh, criticize, you can be criticized, and you can argue, and you can come to some conclusion or not. Of course, the aim is, is the program, not your thinking. Um, whereas in, in the Workers' Revolutionary Party, it was much more a case of uh, not criticism, but bullying, and not self-criticism, but uh, groveling was, was the way out to get redemption. Uh, in fact, you know, much in common with all sorts of religious sects. So the idea of people, uh, area, uh, 
various groups being called sex is perfectly is bang on. Um, and of course, the greatest crime wasn't uh, just disagreeing, but actual thought crime. If you disagreed with Jerry Healy or any of the other leaders, then you were betraying the working class. Um, now, there's the question of, of small groups, as, as Jack was shaking his head about SWP quite right. In Reading, we've got the Reading Socialist Club. And the big difficulty, of course, is COVID-19. We used to meet in the pub. You'd have a, a speaker, you'd discuss, and then you could, you'd break up and you'd talk to people at the next table or, or, or nearby and so on and so on. And it just struck me that in the, the difficulties of getting to uh, Russia for the common term, with COVID-19, of course, we've got, uh, in some ways, similar difficulties of actually getting together and talking to people. On what Marcus was saying, there's no 1917 at the moment, but 1917 came out of the First World War. But what we have got now is COVID-19 and climate change and threats of war. Uh, there's plenty of uh, background, as it were, for urgency in building a party. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Uh, we have Bob Davies next. Bob. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> Jack, I enjoyed that. Thanks so much. Um, you spoke about socialist uh, ideas as a precursor to the Communist Party of Great Britain, particularly at the end of the, um, the 19th century. Um, I think that's quite an important period. Um, a reading of all socialists or self-identified socialists at the time. Their ideas were very uh, sentimental, very um, utopian and non-specific. Uh, I mean, on one level, I can understand why that was the case in terms of Marxist literature around in Britain at the time. I'm not sure the, the volumes, um, but certainly, um, the translated Marxist uh, literature that come, came from Germany, I think, was relatively uh, uh, limited. I mean, I'm currently reading uh, for my son, William Morris, and News from Nowhere. I mean, it was a classical uh, <clears throat> utopian. His book was based on London, I think, it was in the 1950s after uh, a socialist transformation of society. And everybody's walking around very happy with smiles on their faces. They were giving away materials to each other. They're all hugging each other um, uh, in the streets. Yes, there was some references to education and schooling uh, at work, but it was very much a dreamlike society uh, envisaged by socialists um, <clears throat> at the time. So very early developments of ideas in Britain of socialism. Um, I think in terms of programmatic development at the beginning of the 19th century, with the developments of uh, the Labour Party had some progress on this, a more scientific basis. But even then, I think you were prominent socialists. I mean, the likes of Ben Tillett in Britain, who was this very much firebrand, militant trade unionist who had good characteristic traits. Um, you know, and he caused a lot of hassle to the, the British establishment. Good. Even he, you know, as one of the better socialists, and I put that in inverted commas, he spoke of, you know, he had strong, vile traits of national socialism. He was very anti-Semitic against, uh, um, certainly against uh, Jewish immigration uh, into Britain. And he spoke of Germans and the war effort, the building up for the war effort, you know, about beating the Hun and all those nasty, vicious forces of, uh, uh, Austro-Hungary forces and World War One, so <clears throat> very much a contradictory uh, figure, and I'm sure uh, he was typical of and he typified many socialists in uh, uh, that period. But when it comes to as uh, my final point, and when it comes to the birth of the CBGB, I know you, um, I know you mentioned Klugman, and you don't think you like him, and I found, I mean. Some of the book, first couple of volumes, I found um, uh, very uh, interesting. Um, he spoke of a membership of the 
CPGB at the time of around two and a half thousand, uh, I think two thousand, two and a half thousand. Um, Oh, I mean, that to me uh, is quite significant. On one level, you, you, you see that membership is quite small or quite not many numbers, but I think in the terms, and it is, I think as a defining feature of the organization in 1920, um, I think the defining feature of the two and a half thousand was their commitment to uh, not only to daily class struggles, but the commitment uh, to uh, ideas, to revolutionary ideas, you know, and people. Nowadays, see, you know, oh, we've got four, five, six thousand members of the SWP. I'm not sure how many members uh, they have at the moment. But it's not a numbers question, is it? It's a commitment to ideas and it's a commitment to uh, revolutionary change. Um, another trait of that, uh, the other significant parts for me, the formation of, of the, the, the Communist Party, obviously, was its international perspective and it broke off. Uh, with all those, uh, as I mentioned, all those national chauvinist, narrow British uh, outlook that socialists had. And of course, the, um, the programmatic basis um, had a scientific program um, with its caveats of little faults here and little faults there. Uh, but you had scientific uh, programs then for the transformation um, of society. So again, that would be a, a, a key a key uh, characteristic of the formation of uh, the CPGB in Britain. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Bob. Um, we have Kevin next, but um, then Jack is going to come back and uh, address those the points we've had so far. Okay, thank you, Kevin. Please. Okay, thanks, Dan, and uh, thanks, Jack, for a, an interesting uh, talk. Um, I'd like to make some points about the sort of writing of the history of the period. Um, you mentioned Klugman, and um, I, I remember when I began reading um, a little more in a little more detail in this period, I asked comrades about the sort of best books, and um, every time I mentioned a particular author, comrades for some reason why it wasn't. And in fact, um, as far as I can see, there isn't one sort of uh, maybe, uh, to, you know, to kind of phrase a short course on the history of the CPGB. Um, and I think that's, uh, that is not, uh, as they say, isn't an accident, particularly because um, all historians, particularly when they're writing in, in a political course, will tend to frame it in a particular way. And I think um, one of the things that is quite interesting with the later CPGB is the importance of their historians group, and indeed, much of what uh, we, we think of as mainstream Marxist history in Britain, and I'm thinking of the Hobsbawms and the Hills and so on, you know, really did emanate from that source. And it has, you know, strengths and weaknesses accordingly. Um, but I think there's also a sort of counter tradition, which in some ways um, sort of Stalinizes the British party much earlier than, than, than perhaps it, it was, and maybe also tends to highlight other traditions. So for example, a book which um, I remember reading in the 70s um, by Ray, Ray Chaloner, uh, someone who I met in, in later life, broadly from an SWP position, who um, wrote about the SLP and described it as the birth of British Bolshevism. And um, I think that uh, one of the difficulties for us is that uh, we often come, again, this is, all, this is almost so unexpected, exceptional is to be sort of trite, but we all come to that period with particular biases. So the SWP members of the, the 60s onwards saw the CP probably from its, from its birth as being bureaucratic and Stalinistic, um, probably overemphasizing the BSP and the Heinemannism and uh, giving much greater play to the, the sort of syndicalism and the proto-IS nature of the SLP uh, in that way. So in some ways, I think it's a case of, um, you know, going back to the sources as all good historians would or should and um, reading some of the material of the groups. I think the weekly worker has done a very good job in putting that material in the public domain, but really reading complete runs of papers and getting a real idea of what those groups are like. 
Um, in, in a previous uh, incarnation, I did quite a bit of work about the SDF and the ILP and some of the weaving trade unions in East Lancashire. And um, the point that, that Jack makes about their working class following, particularly in Burnley, which is where uh, Henry Myers Hindman actually stood as a, as a candidate on a number of occasions, in his reminiscences, a fairly hefty two volume thing, but he describes the, um, describes the various election campaigns and um, from from what I know of, um, of yeah, we seem to have lost. Kind of, yeah, there was quite a thriving socialist culture, and I suppose that I suppose the key point here that it really came in with with Mike's point, and I think with Marcus's point as well is that 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 and gyms too that sort of culture and i don't mean that in a rather sort of soppy way and i don't even mean it in just being nice to people i mean it that there was a a, 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 a culture of discussion and of building a movement and of quite you know powerful self-education even many people who went on far to the labor right you know cut their teeth in the sdf and as such it was a i think a much more influential organization than than, than you know, many people um, you know give it credit for. Anyway, thanks, comrades. Okay, thanks, Kevin. Um, I'm calling back Jack Conrad now to address the points. So yeah, far. thanks for the questions and uh, contributions. Um, yeah, I mean the, the the talk was titled as it was titled, uh, Ethram. So. Um, it wasn't um, the task for communists today. Um, really, all I was trying to do, I suppose, is to show that this this organisation had a, a deeper history. Um, and yes, um, to emphasise that it wasn't simply unity, but it was a series of um, splits and mergers that didn't even culminate um, in 1920 on August the 1st, but actually continued. And uh, yes, I wanted to emphasize uh, the importance of um, international developments and yes, international or authority in that. Uh, I don't know the Trotsky quote, but I'm sure it's brilliant. And uh, if Trotsky said something along the lines of, you know, whatever you said under the party, with the party, in the party or whatever, um, yeah, that's that's the argument. Uh, basically, what I'm saying, though, isn't that today's left is totally useless. It, it's not because, um, you know, all you need to do uh, again, I haven't been down to it. But if you look at the school kids protesting, uh, the SWP is down there um, in Downing Street. Um, you know, if you look at Black Lives Matter, however much the SWP was observing lockdown, nonetheless, uh, you've got, uh, I can't remember the name of the film star that uh, addressed Black Lives Matter because I don't know much about Star Wars, but you had Gary McFarlane uh, from the SWP. You know, if you look at what's going on in um, Unison or the Communication Workers Union at the moment in, in terms of fighting redundancies and the new general secretary. The left is there. And um, we can't just say that it doesn't exist or it's unimportant. The, the, the point I'm really making, the, the, the argument I'm making is it, it's a lot less influential um, and has a lot less of an impact than it could. That's the point that I'm making. If you look at the Labour Party, the, the Labour left is there, often organised by people who consider themselves Marxists. Uh, the point I'm really trying to say, that if, if you look at the history of the CPGB, it, it, it wasn't a leap from total irrelevance and total uh, nothingness into the, a communist party, but it was a qualitative, qualitative development. And OK, um, uh, I readily accept, and again, was uh, trying to emphasize uh, in terms of what Marcus was saying, 
the role of Russia, Lenin and all the rest of it. And OK, we haven't got the October Revolution. We don't have a Lenin. We don't have a left wing communism. Nevertheless, the point that I'm making is if you take the prehistory, it also involved mergers. And if you take the, the British Socialist Party, it involved a merger of the Clarion, uh, supporters of the Clarion. And it also involved uh, a merger with comrades um, from the left of the ILP. It, it did have an influence. It wasn't a nothing. And again, in terms of what Mike uh, was saying, if you take the original um, Social Democratic Party in Germany, it didn't come from, you know, huge mass um, organizations. It triggered uh, that mass development. And you can make the argument uh, elsewhere. So, of, of course, the conditions are not the same. And OK, I readily accept what Jim says, uh, you know, COVID-19 and um, the danger of war. Um, the point is to try to free the imagination uh, of today's left, uh, that it isn't likely to be a situation that the SWP will lead the revolu revolution in isolation uh, from um, spew or, or from the Labour left, um, that, that these forces uh, can be uh, merged, can be uh, united. And it, under those circumstances, you can then get a qualitative development, which you didn't have, of course, uh, with the CPGB. It always remains small, uh, as I said, even at its height, 45,000, but that's in the midst of World War II and uh, Uncle Joe uh, and all the rest of it. Nevertheless, clearly the formation of the CPGB represented a qualitative step forward compared with what was. And I think that that lesson ought to be uh, made available to today's left and actually ought to motivate uh, today's uh, uh, left. Um, yeah, so no, I'm not equating the, obviously the SWP, uh, Ethram, with um, the South Wales Socialist Society, but I'm sort of equating without wanting to bum Jim Cook up too much. But I am saying there were loads of other organizations besides the South Wales Socialist Society, just like uh, the Reading Socialist Society, just like the Brighton Socialist Society. And one can just carry on uh, down the list. In Liverpool, um, there's a, um, a, a left that involves not only people in the Labour Party, um, ex-militant, um, all manner uh, of different people. Th these exist throughout Britain. Uh, they aren't organised. They're not uh, uh, contained in a, in a single organisation. You know, if you look at the SWP, I mean, it is the SWP. It isn't the BSP and it's not the SLP. Uh, it's a sect, though, um, and it can mobilize its members on demonstrations, but it has much less impact in terms of uh, its cadre uh, than it could have. And uh, I, I agree with the description of Marcus, a rag bag, you know, and bobtail. That's what we've got on the left at the present time. Um, and they could be uh, united. Um, and we don't need to wait uh, for a Lenin. We don't need to wait uh, for a Russian revolution. At least that's my um, argument. There is necessity. Uh, there, is, there is actually looking at the tasks we have in front of us and what you could do. And um, when, where, I don't know. All I would say is that uh, necessity is the mother of invention. And um, yes, it's necessary to merge, but it's also necessary if we're going to merge, to go through a series of struggles which involve splits, certainly the overthrow of the bureaucratic regimes of the SWP, but also the overthrow of the localism of the Reading Socialist Society or the, the comrades in Liverpool, and one can carry on uh, down that list. Um, in terms of Bob, sorry, Bob, I, I missed who you were talking about. Were you talking about Ben Tillett? I'm not quite sure. Um, either way, if you were talking about Ben uh, Tillett, oh, yes. um, what was who was it? Um, I spoke about William Morris first, then Ben Tillett, yes. Yeah, okay. Ben Tillett, he was actually taught to read uh, by Marx's daughter, 
Um, yes, and he had all sorts of funny politics and ended up um, on the right. He was uh, a lead, one of the leaders of these uh, mass uh, uh, trade unions uh, um, that TNG uh, that yeah began uh, in the SDF. I don't know exactly what his politics were, but clearly they went rotten pretty bloody uh, quickly. Uh, just on membership, worthwhile pointing out that the BSP claimed 9,000 members. Uh, I don't know what the membership claim of the Communist Unity Group or the SLP or the WSF and all these local socialist societies was. But the point I was making is that they went in with these rather grand membership claims and you end up with 2,000 or 2,500. But the 2,500 or the 2,000 were far more effective uh, than <laughs> the constituent parts. And that's the point uh, that I'm making. And again, just to pick up on uh, Mike's uh, point that, you know, if we look uh, at the formation of the Socialist Alliance, which Marcus was uh, in no small measure involved in, if we look at the formation of these unity uh, groups, I mean, the, the left unity was a particularly useless one. Nevertheless, it still began uh, with a conference, you know, of thousand people, or was it 500, whatever it happens to be. Uh, there is a recognition um, on the left that's very healthy of the need for unity. The problem that we've got is it's now the common sense of the left uh, that you, you unite on a so-called broad basis. You unite on a common denominator or lowest common denominator basis. Marcus will remember um, uh, Dave Nellist and his 20... 80 formula, if I get it right, uh, i.e. we should unite on the 80% that we agree on and forget the 20% that we disagree on. And I think what I'm trying to get over is if you take the CPGB, it united not on the 20% where they disagreed, but they united on a higher level. And it, it involved overcoming the backwardness of all component parts. So the BSP's social pacifism was overcome. The SLP Communist Unity Group syndicalism was overcome. Uh, the localism was overcome. Um, you know, so uh, we are talking about a higher level of, of unity. Um, um, and that to me is the key. And that's why, yeah, Mike referenced uh, the necessity of uniting around Marxism, not some nuance of Marxism, uh, but the basic uh, strands, the basic uh, uh, building blocks uh, of Marxism. That's what we are uh, talking about. Um, yeah, just uh, lastly, in well, no, lastly with Bob, um, in defense of William Morris, I mean, it, it, the name of the book, A Dream, uh, was it Dream of Nowhere? New from Nowhere. News from nowhere. Well, of course, nowhere is utopia. That's where the word comes from. It is a dream. He falls asleep in Hammersmith and wakes up under communism in Hammersmith. Um, he was a member of the Hammersmith Socialist Society. Um, but he does have a murder in it, Bob. You know, um, it's not quite all uh, hugs and kisses, but I, I, I accept what you mean. Um, it is a dream. Of course it is. Um, but it, it, it's also meant to act as an inspiration that this is the sort of society that we can uh, realize. Um, just lastly, in terms of what Kevin was saying, I, I agree with you, Kevin. Uh, there are no decent, there's not any decent history um, of the CPGB. I think they're pretty, not uniformly bad, uh, but they're all bad and some are dreadful. And uh, yeah, the idea that the SLP is Britain's Bolshevik, you know, Britain's Bolsheviks is bollocks, um, you know, it, it, ridiculous. Um, no, most of the histories are silly. Most of the histories are wanting to dismiss it as uh, instantly Stalinist. It's true that if you take the CPGB, I think because of its size, um, all sorts of reasons, um, it did not show any um, theoretical depth um, um, or originality. Uh, nonetheless, what you had is many skilled, many talented people um, who developed their talents. Um, 
um, um, in it. Uh, and just finally, in terms of complete runs, should be, uh, um, well, comedy should be aware um, that uh, the present series in The Weekly Worker isn't the first time that we've ran it. Um, I think this might be its third outing, might be, I can't remember. But originally this work was done by the partner of uh, Michael Malkin, Michael uh, Bettany, uh, called Marion, uh, Marion Johnson, who's no longer with us. I mean, she's still alive, <laughs> I hasten to add. But she actually went to Mark's Memorial Library and was either allowed to photocopy whole runs of the socialist, whole runs of workers' dreadnought, whole runs of uh, the call. Um, she diligently um, typed the stuff up and I edited uh, and wrote the first introductions to it. And so, yeah, I at least have had the privilege, and it was a privilege uh, to actually read week after week after week. And it, you know, it wasn't a, it wasn't a bind, uh, editions of the call, editions of the socialist, edition of editions of workers dreadnought, the communist uh, uh, that comes out uh, of the call. And quite frankly, it was fascinating stuff. Um, as I said, I was very impressed uh, by Sylvia Pankhurst's uh, writing abilities and uh, international coverage. Uh, but yeah, um, uh, that stuff ought to be done by a proper historian. Unfortunately, I don't know what the hell we've done with this material. Um, we've asked Marion. Um, it will be somewhere, but where, uh, I don't know. That stuff is worthwhile going back to. Uh, I agree with you. What we need is uh, a good history um, of the CPGB, and there isn't one at the present time. Okay, thanks, Jack. Um, if we have any more people who would like to speak, then don't hesitate to put yourself forward. Um, also, um, if you'd like a second go, then that is also fine. Um, I'm calling Stan Keeble now. Stan Keeble. Yes, I had a nice time in the park listening to the opening on my phone. This is the advantage of Zoom and uh, Zoom meetings. Um, and I'll come back in time for the discussion. Um, I, I, wanted, I just wanted to comment on a couple of, I don't want to talk about the past actually. Um, I'm going to just talk about today's situation and what we're doing. Because, uh, what was it, Marcus spoke about, uh, well he seemed to say, and I might be getting it wrong Marcus, but um, you know, why, why waste time on the uh, existing groups like SWP or SPU, um, that seemed to be what you're saying, you know, and of course, the, I don't know whether that's right, I'll, you'll have to answer to say whether that's what you're saying, but um, I mean, uh, to me, that's a choice between whether we address the politics of uh, existing Marxist groups, bureaucratic sects maybe, but they are organised, and they are, you know, putting forward their views as well as what they do. Um, and uh, that is one way. The alternative to that is what some people tell us to do, which is to stop wasting our time on them and uh, concentrating on building the kind of party you want, which would make us, you know, a competing, uh, it would tend to make us a competing group, wouldn't it? Uh, rather than trying to get unity of, uh, of, of the left around Marxist politics. Um, so, in other words, the groups are a preferable target to individuals. We've got loads of what you call a sect of one, where uh, people have been in everything and then now they're not in anything, but uh, they're still uh, looking around. Okay, there are lots of those, but by, uh, by focusing on the existing groups, um, we deal with the whole. That's one thing. I thought also Ephraim, Ephra I see Ephraim's asked to come back anyway, but uh, I'm detecting, again, when I, when I spoke about um, platypus cynicism the other day, I think it was Anne said, oh, I didn't know that was uh, platypus. Well, I can tell, and Ephraim, tell me if I'm wrong, platypus is a dead animal, and platypus organisation is always talking about the left is dead. Isn't that their slogan? The left is dead. And uh, so, I mean, why ask these cynical questions? You know, what about it? You know, uh, what's your answer? Anyway, our method, our method is to make propaganda for the draft programme 
for the polit Marxist politics that are necessary. We have got a draft programme they're putting forward for, and that goes for the organised Marxist left, as they call themselves, or, or goes for the individuals as well, isn't it? Um, the the programmes there. We would intervene in whatever whatever happens to the extent that we're able to into events in the in in politics, events in the class struggle, or any uh, initiatives that are taken by others in the direction of unity. But it's propaganda and intervention. But of course, our extent of intervention is limited, isn't it? Uh, because we're small. Okay, uh, can't be helped. I'm afraid. Um, and uh, so critiquing the existing groups is, you know, is, is the method uh, in order to argue for that uh, Marxist programme. And it is the political programme, isn't it? It's practical. It's not credo. Credo is, uh, you say, we believe in Marxism. Yes, but Marxism is a practical uh, thing. Uh, you, um, and and the, the political programme is a practical uh, thing, not what you believe in as such um and uh, so yes principled mergers principled splits uh, i agree with that john uh, jack um and uh, so politics follows sorry wrong way around organization follows from politics so the organizing a communist party um whether you know to what extent it consists of splits what you can extent it consists of mergers remains to be seen we can't determine that in advance can we but it follows from the politics so the important thing is to argue for the program uh winning the argument for the marxist program is the same thing as building reforging uh, or forging the cpgb thank you okay thanks dan can i have uh, peter please peter manson Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> really, I, I'd just like to follow on from what Stan was saying just now. Um, I mean, there's been comrades have raised the state of the existing left. What do we do about that? I mean, it's obviously a very real question in, uh, because we need to uh, learn the lessons of 100 years ago in the formation of the CPGB and try and put them into practice today. So, but if, if you look at today's left, uh, what is uh, noticeable about each of the sects, and that's, I'm talking about ranging from the larger groups, the SWP, SPU, the CPB, uh, to the smaller gatherings, you know, the AWL and the people like that, uh, just about all of them, they say that uh, we, are the embryo of the future mass party that we need. If you look at, I mean, take a look at the SWP and the CPB in particular, for the most part, they don't bother mentioning any of the other groups. It's as though they don't exist. It's only us. We're the answer. Everyone's got to join us. Um, but as I say, the, the small sects that are formed, they, they also behave on, on the same basis. You know, we, we formed a new party because we split away from whatever we split away with because it was this, uh, they were wrong on such and such a question, but we got the right answer, so everyone should join us. And, you you know, this kind of splitting and splitting again has been the history of the, of the far left uh, for decades and decades. So it's just, what can we do to combat that? Um, in contrast to the likes of the SWP and the CPB, who largely ignore the, all, all the left groups, we, through the Weekly Worker in particular, focus on left groups, as Stan has just been saying. Why do we do that? I mean, it's not because we're often described as a kind of gossip sheet. You know, we do, we're just we're just talking for the sake of it about all, all the other left groups. No. We want to look at the left groups for a particular reason. We want to point to their inadequacies, their, their actual sectarianism, the, the lack of genuine democratic centralism, 
and and their belief in in themselves and and no other answer because we want we want to through doing this we want these groups to come to the answer that is necessary what we do, what we need to do is form a marxist party on a principal basis that's all genuine marxists in wh whichever group they are in at the moment somehow need to come together we need to come together on a principal basis and that uh, by principal basis i mean on uh, well first of all it could be a very very brief programmatic document which everyone agrees to accept and um, essentially the acceptance of genuine democratic centralism where everyone has the right to disagree and in, in public but at the same time they must abide by majority decisions but as opposed to the kind of bureaucratic centralism that other comrades have, have described so well um so no that's what we need we need a single marxist party on a principal basis how do we get it let's uh you know we we, we in the in the cpgb we've we've taken part with a, a degree of enthusiasm on groups like the socialist alliance or uh where at least the the various left groups have come together on a limited basis but we need to such an uh, initiative would sooner or later have to be taken again we do need to unite and it does have to be on a principal basis thank you okay thank you very much peter uh can i have sarah mcdonald please sarah Nice. Thank you, Dan. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to come uh, in on Stan's point, but then again, as Peter was speaking, I've made uh, additional notes which are around about the same uh, kind of thing. So firstly, uh, Stan uh, on uh, Pilatipus, um, as people have pointed out already in the chat column, um, it's very much an alive thing. I think the point about Pilatipus as a group was that the animal itself doesn't know what it is. Is it an animal? Uh, is, it, is it a bird, is it a mammal, is it a sea creature, is it an eggling mammal, um, which is sort of a, a very confused being. Uh, and I think that that was why it was the, the organisation named itself such. Uh, comrades who are uh, in the organisation can um, correct me if I'm wrong on that. Um, and, you know, it wasn't a frame actually that made the point that Stan really objected to and got quite... Um, aggressive about uh, on the first session, I think it was in the first session, uh, it was somebody called Rebecca and uh, I agree with Anne actually, I didn't, I didn't understand the, the, where, we, where Stan got the idea this, this person would come from Pilatus, maybe she did, maybe she didn't, um, but I thought the points that she was making were around uh, what is the purpose of your organisation in terms of perspectives, i.e. Uh, where do you see yourself in 10 years time? Uh, and what is your strategy for getting there? Um, and, and that is something that harks back to that discussion that we were having uh, around the Labour Party, um, which is an important discussion to have, especially for- Sarah, Sarah, you sound a little bit unclear. I don't know if okay. you can speak closer to the microphone or something. Okay, uh, I've got my uh, AirPods in. Let me just see if I can um, put it onto my- Okay. Can you hear me better now? Yeah, much, much. Okay. All right. Sorry, as I had uh, headphones in. Um, so, did you hear the first part of what I said, or shall I go back? Dan. Dan. Yes. Shall I shall I go back to what I said at the start, or could um, you hear it? Yes, please. I can go back a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Uh, just for the point around Stan, uh, the Pilatus as an organisation, as far as I'm aware. Uh, the a Pilatipus as, a, as an animal that doesn't quite know what it is, it's an egg-laying mammal. I think that was the, the reason for the, the name of the group was it, it wasn't quite, didn't quite know what it was. Uh, the left is dead, long live the left, I think is the, but people who are involved in that organisation can certainly correct me if I'm wrong. Um, Frame wasn't the person who made the comment on that session. It was a, a, a woman called Rebecca, a young woman in America, or American woman by the sounds of it, who I don't know. And I, I understand why Anne didn't, I recognise her as being Plasmus because she didn't necessarily come across as such. I could be wrong. Um, and she was talking about perspectives, um, and John was quite right when he summed up on that. 
um, session about, how, you know, sort of where do you see yourself in 10 years time? What's the purpose of your organisation? Uh, you know, are, are we a time capsule? Are we something that, uh, you know, sort of ca that um, has captured all these, these debates and discussions? Uh, or, are we, you know, are, are we something else? Uh, and that's a valid question to raise. Uh, and it links into what Peter talked about. Because I don't think Peter's contribution was a massive reflection of, of what we currently do in terms of our current perspective, uh, because we haven't really orientated towards the existing left for a little while because of the situation in the Labour Party. An overwhelming majority of people's work has been in the Labour Party or in law or in, in such organisations uh, around that. So the question is a valid question is, do you reorientate to the left? Do we engage with socialism? Do we engage with uh, the estimate? WP's Marxism and all that kind of thing. If there is a new left unity project, uh, you know, how much of our efforts do we engage in it? How much of a leading position do we want to take in it? Uh, and so on and so forth. And Mike McNair's contribution at the end of that first session was around, uh, you know, sort of the traction or lack thereof of, of, of the existing left. So while we could orientate, has it uh, proven itself bankrupt? Um, so I think, you know, in terms of our perspectives is, you know, and it, was, it comes back to what Anne said on one side of the argument in the first discussion and what Marcus was uh, uh, proposing in this discussion uh, is, you know, how do you orient, do you orientate to the left or do you orientate to the Labour Party and movements around that? And, and, and that's the question around it, uh, as far as I can see. That's all. Okay, thanks, Sarah. Um, I'd just like to read out Mark's comment in the... Uh, in the comments section. Uh, I think his microphone is broken. So um, anyway, he's written, um, this is Mark Lewis. Obviously it would be a bad thing for the contemporary left to simply disappear. It needs to be superseded positively, but clearly it is constituting itself as an obstacle to the process of dynamic unity that Mike described. Our work in the Labour Party has been principled and modestly successful, given the constraints on us but it is clear that in many ways we are talking Klingon to the vast majority of the Labour Party members we engage with, including those who may have been in some left sect or other in the past. I am very aware of the paucity of our resources, but do comrades think that some orientation to the left sect might be useful, even if it is simply a more thorough intervention at their annual schools, etc. In the ranks of the SWP, the SA, the SP, we have people who at least are taught a dialect of Klingon. Just amusing, really. Good opening, Jack. Okay, um, I would like to call um, Ephraim back again. And after that, I'll have Mike McNair, please. So Ephraim. Thanks. Yeah, uh, sorry. I, um, as people have pointed out in the comments, Platypus is very much an alive animal in Australia and a, a live organization in several countries. <laughs> um, and yeah, it's, it's about the strangeness of the animal, right? That kind of misrecognition. Um, and uh, Marcus has several pet platypi, platypos, whatever the plural is. Um, I think, and, and for, you know, for information's sake, Rebecca, who asked the question, is a member of Platypus, but I think Sarah's right that that shouldn't really matter um, in terms of how someone assesses the question. Um, and the slogan is, long, is the left is dead, long live the left, right? So it's about recognizing the situation as being the first step towards overcoming it. Um, thanks, Mark. Um, I actually wanted to turn the conversation in, back in a different direction. I don't, um, you know, I think this conversation for the CPGB is interesting, but I actually wanted to get Jack to really respond to what Mike said um, in his first comment about political independence and this issue of really of the second international. Um, and Mike kind of laid it out as a trajectory of the first international in terms of um, the working class um, stepping onto the stage of international politics and high politics. Um, and that that question of political independence really becomes institutionalized in the form of the second international. And so the foundation of the third international is um, really a kind of tenuous question actually as to whether 
um, you know, it was it was um, able to establish political independence. Um, and I think the discussion of, um, you know, I note that Mike uses the example of Brexit, but not the example of the Labour Party. Right. So why, you know, why not say that, um, you know, the other option for tailing today is tailing the Labour Party, which, of course, it is um, as a kind of liberal, progressive, um, liberal, progressive capitalist politics. Um, and on the point about Hindman, I thought I maybe thought Mike would have pushed back a bit against the um, criticism of Hindman playing the Tories in Hampstead and Kentish Town. I don't I don't know the exact situation, but there is a question for the left, um, which is in terms of establishing even the idea of political independence, which is independence from uh, would be today independence from both the Labour Party and the Conservative Party, whether a political force would actually um, be able to, uh, you know, withhold its vote in some way. I mean, there, there's an issue around accepting money. I didn't know they accepted money from Tories, but um, I just, I'm just kind of asking what does political independence mean there and, and did the CPGB ever really have it? Um, or was that kind of, you know, because I think Jack's point, which I agree with, you know, his clarification to my first comment was that the achievement we're talking about here is the unity on a higher basis of the pre-existing kind of second international era groups in Britain, which never really formed a mass party. And so the question was, on that basis, would the CPG be form a mass party? And it didn't. And it ceased to have political independence really by the late 20s and 30s, definitely. Um, so yeah, maybe you could comment on that kind of second international political independence and, and whether that was ever, ever viable with the CPGB early on. Okay, thanks Ephraim. Can we have Mike McNair please? Mike, thank you. Yeah. Um... I guess it's addressed to uh, Mark's point, which you read out uh, um, in the comments, and in a sense also to uh, in sense also to uh, Ephraim's point. What what have we been doing in the Labour Party? I don't think I may be wrong on this, and we may have misunderstood what's going on. My 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 understanding of what we've been trying to do in the Labour Party is to orient to. Uh, the left in the Labour Party, meaning not primarily the Corbynista left, but uh, the people who come out of the hard left who are in the Labour Party and into orienting to people who are attempting to organise. Uh, so, for example, the guys who, you know, Graham Bash and co, uh, these guys are trot entrists who went into the Labour Party as trot entrists in the late 1960s and uh, still when pushed on this will represent themselves as holding some sort of peculiar version of Trotskyism. Uh, quite a lot of the people who are around the general Corbynista movement and in particular the people who kick back to some extent against the uh, 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 witch hunt stuff uh, are people who are ex-SWPers and ex-left uh, group of one sort and another. So that I when Mark uh, makes the point that uh, it's as if we were talking Klingon and uh, Marcus says maybe we should stop start talking English instead, uh, it's still the case. We're actually orienting to, we're trying to orient to the hard left. Whether uh, the, 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 the practical value and limits of that, I, we have to be aware of that because it's the, there's two separate issues involved, one of which is uh, the strategic question of the Labour Party, and this is uh, addresses more Ephraim's point, that the Labour Party is contradictory organisation. It's contradictory because on the one hand, it claims to be the representative of the working class as a whole, and 
uh, it expresses that in its name, that it calls itself the Labour Party and not the Socialist Party or the Social Democratic Party or whatever the hell it is, and that it in and in the form of having the uh, trade union affiliate and actually also socialist society. So the the Fabians are still an affiliate of the Labour Party. Paul of Zion call themselves Jewish Labour Movement or an affiliate of the Labour Party. Um, he, he, that is an expression of the Labour Party claiming to represent uh, the class as a whole and not to be a uh, defined politically, but it's also a loyalist organization. It's an organization which is it's not that it's reformist, it's not that it's gradualist, it's that it's loyalist towards the British state and the British constitution. And that loyalism has historically been uh, expressed, was expressed in the refusal to accept affiliation of the original CPGB, was expressed in the purge of uh, uh, Communist Party members and supporters, was expressed in the periodic, has been expressed in periodic purges since then, and most recently is expressed in the uh, um, uh, uh, anti-Zionism equals anti-Semitism witch hunt. That is an expression of Labour Party loyalism. Now, there's a strategic need, which is, something which I think that the left as a whole doesn't get to break, to smash open, to drive apart that contradiction, force the Labour Party either to abandon its uh, claim to represent the whole class or to uh, abandon its um, loyalist boundary setting, which excludes uh, communists and anti-imperial, which is to exclude communists and anti-imperialists. It's, that's a strategic problem. And it's actually just as much a problem for the uh, Morning Star guys as it is for us. And it's just as much a problem for the um, Socialist Workers Party or for the Socialist Party. It's the Socialist Party, they assumed that the Labour Party had wholly gone over, no longer had dynamics which would throw up Labour leftism. Um, and set up to create a new Labour Party of the exact same bloody character in reality, um, in the form of uh, 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 campaign for New Workers' Party and then Tusk. You know? So that's a strategic problem for the whole of the left. But at the same time, we don't have the bleeding forces to be able to... Uh, but then the, the question, in a sense, which is posed by it is, OK, it's a real issue. It's not ta political tailing the Labour Party is what uh, the Morning Star does. And it, you can tail the Labour Party from the outside. You don't have to be inside. In fact, the Morning Star, precisely as uh, 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 Jack said in the uh, first presentation of this, uh, uh, you, this, this, uh, occasion said uh, the um, Morning Star said, "Oh, we will expel um, any of our members who are infiltrating the Labour Party." Mm -hmm. So that the, there is a separate issue about what 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 is the most practical use, which Mark I think correctly raises. What's the most practical use of the resources of uh, uh, this microscopic? Uh, group, uh, CPG, BPCC, uh, is it most practical for us to be engaging with um, uh, the Labour Party far left, or should we be putting more effort into engaging with the uh, outside Labour organised far left? I uh, I don't know at the moment. It's what, what I don't think we're about to have is another left unity, another respect, another socialist alliance. Uh, simply because uh, the extent to which the um, Corbyn movement smashed that project, um, the fact that the Corbyn movement has been smashed, I don't think is going to uh, cause the idea of uh, new Labour Party, broad left party type projects to resurface. That's just a, 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 a matter of practical judgment. Um, the one other thing, which is just a sort of uh, token point, the back part of the background to the formation of the Labour Party 
in 1900 was that the ILP and the SDF were winning local elections on a sufficient scale that uh, the uh, trade union tops who were committed to the Liberal Party uh, couldn't say, oh, we have to stand under the Liberal platform, because if they did that, the IRP would, the SDF would just go on standing. And uh, what they had to do was create a Labour Party so that it's the, the, there is the electoral work. This stuff is happening. It is, is possible for things to happen under circumstances which are pretty bloody adverse, which I have to say that the circumstances of the British left before the formation of the Labour Party were pretty bloody adverse with the trade unions overwhelmingly committed to the Liberal Party. It's like the United States. That's it. Okay, thanks, Mike. Um, so I'm going to call back Jack Conrad now, but um, I think we're coming up to quarter past 12. So I guess this will be the summing up um, for the meeting. Okay. Well, if someone wants to, um dive in and don't uh, don't hold back because I don't think I've got that much uh, to say really but some very interesting points um, have been raised just I mean I had to rush out Stan call of nature so sorry for missing some of your contribution uh, but from what I gather I sort of agree with it that um, what we are stressing is program and practical uh, demands and an overall approach not a belief. So we're, we're not um, uh, demanding of uh, Trotskyist comrades that they abandon, if, they, if that's what their analysis leads them to, um, loyalty to the idea that uh, the Soviet Union represented some sort of worker state to the very end. I mean, um, I believed that uh, in 1991. And we're not requiring uh, comrades who think it was uh, state capitalist, or you, one can carry on down the list. Um, we, we would uh, find it perfectly acceptable to recruit uh, a member of the Church of England, and indeed we've had a uh, short time, um, a Church of England vicar as a, a, a member. Uh, Michael Bettany, I've, I've mentioned, was a sort of, well, he was Catholic. So it, it is a programme. Uh, at the same time, the programme... <laughs> does say that we're in favour of uh, atheistic propaganda, but that's a problem for these comrades to solve, not us. But the point is, yes, it's about a programme. This is how the working class can organise itself, and this is how the working class can liberate itself. And comrades can come along and say, well, I don't agree with this. Well, let's debate it then. And we can debate it uh, openly, and we can debate it if need be over a considerable period, and that will be healthy. Um, in terms of what Peter was saying, a very brief document. Well, I don't really know what you mean uh, there, uh, Peter. Um, it, it, if it's a very brief document that's of a, a lowest con common denominator, then no. Um, I, I don't think that that's what we're talking. We are talking, we're presenting, not as a, an ultimatum, we are presenting our draft program and our draft rules to the movement and saying, well, what do you think about this? That's what we're uh, presenting. And actually, in historical terms, it's very long, uh, much, much longer uh, than the programs of classical Marxism. And the reason for that is uh, that we've had uh, the betrayal of official social democracy, and then we've had whatever you want to call it, official communism, bureaucratic socialism, Stalinism, Maoism, um, and one can carry on. And for that reason, I think it's right that we do a lot more detail about democracy and stuff like that and democratic centralism and what we mean by it than you would have done in the 19th century. Um, so I, I think that that maybe it's too long what we've got, but um, I'd be very hesitant uh, to take a knife to it and to uh, pare it down to something of the length of the uh, program of the French Workers' Party, or for that matter, the Erfurt program, or, or whatever, or the R RSDLP. Um, anyway, uh, if we're talking about principle um, and a uh, high level of organization, then great. Um, we're not talking about bureaucratic 
centralism. We are talking about uh, uh, Conway's having the freedom to criticize and that being the norm of party culture, uh, not the exception. Um, in terms of what Sarah was saying, well, sort of agreeing with Mike, you know, that when we're dealing with the Labour Party, our target audience, who we imagine, we imagine, we don't know, I don't know who reads our, our stuff, some people do, but in terms of what, what we have in, well, what I have in my head is not the average Labour Party member or not even um, Labour Party activists. It is those people who consider themselves Marxists or near Marxism or, or for that matter, serious anarchists or whoever. People who've got an idea of the left. And so what we're saying to them, is, and we've always said this, you know, going way back to our very origins, the Labour Party is a bourgeois workers' party. It's a strategic, it's a strategic question of the British Revolution, and you have to deal with it. And there are a number of, way, a number of ways of dealing with it, but ignoring it will not do. Um, so we're against liquidation into laborism, and we're against liquidation into the Labour Party as things stand now. Um, so we in, intervene in the Labour Party, yes, uh, and we have an organization that's separate from the Labour Party. If we were allowed to affiliate with full freedom of criticism, that is what we would do. Um, but that would be a huge change uh, in Britain. Anyway, my main point is that uh, our, our audience, our imagined audience, um, is uh, in the SWP, is in SPEW, and are the exiles from SPEW and the SWP and all the other 57 varieties. Um, so in terms of, um, we're not talking Klingon uh, to them. Uh, we are talking in terms of a broadly speaking common language, although given our separation, clearly we're talking about uh, um, a strong dialect uh, problem. Often we're talking at cross purposes. You say transitional, I say minimum. You think minimum means nothing. I think minimum means a fucking lot, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Nonetheless, I think we're understandable although of course we have to explain ourselves and they have to explain themselves as well. Um, so it's a, a process. Nonetheless, that's what our, our target is. It's called the advanced element of the working class, the vanguard. If you go back to Lenin's sort of textbook for the early communist international, left-wing communism, he talks about the Russian situation. He says, we won the, the vanguard. That's the first thing we had to do. We haven't done that. All right. So before they go to the masses, uh, before they can talk about mass work, uh, they're talking about the necessity to achieve the victory of Marxism um, 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 in, in Russia amongst the vanguard. OK, so that still remains uh, our, our task. I thought, Ephraim, Brian, um, you asked a very interesting question or posed um, um, a very interesting problem. And I think that either deliberately or accidentally, I suspect deliberately, um, you put your finger on it. And that is, if you look at the Third International, you know, if I was around in 1919, 1920, unhesitatingly, I would join. Um, on the other hand, you know, let's think about how the Third International was formed with what what in mind it was formed. It was formed on the basis uh, that the Bolsheviks and most of us at the time thought the world revolution was imminent. It, it really is just around the corner. Uh, maybe don't push too hard, maybe push harder, but it's going to be quick. It's going to be uh, um, not protracted, right? Um, under those conditions, the level of discipline that was required uh, was to all intents and purposes, whether that was put into practice, that's a different question. Um, but it was essentially Russian. And it was Russian on the basis of fighting the civil war, uh, suppressing factions, uh, top down. I know I am not against that in principle, but top down. Um, and yes, that was applied to national sections because the 
the the vision was we'll be fighting uh, an international civil war uh, we'll be fighting an international class struggle um and under those conditions where well, we need military discipline and the national parts should do what they're told and precisely if you look at the degeneration that's going on in Russia because of isolation, almost national sections, especially Germany, become a sort of plaything um, for the various factions or the various individuals. Um, and, it, and yes, in that sense, the, the form of organization, while understandable in 1919, 1920, 1922, maybe 23, but even then I start, I, th I think it becomes problematic is not suited for a protracted struggle. And you're quite right that if you look at the CPGB, I'd, I'm, you have to read my writings on 1926. I don't think that the CPGB was unhealthily jumping to the command of Moscow in 1926. If anything, in 1926, uh, the comrades in the Soviet Union were much more useful and had much more of an idea of what was at stake than they did in Britain. But that aside, certainly once you come to the so-called third period, while there was pushback in Britain, they go along with it. They go along with socialism in one country. They go along uh, with the anti-Trotsky campaign. So in 26, I think they publish Trotsky in the CPGB with a glowing introduction by uh, Palm Dutt saying, what a, where's Britain going? I think it was. Brilliant introduction by Palm Dutt. And then Trotsky is... Uh, a non-person sort of idea, or becomes uh, the devil. And so, yeah, in terms of international politics, was the CPGB independent? Absolutely not. It was slavish. Um, you know, Tito is a fascist. And when that starts to change, it doesn't unfortunately change for the better, because precisely the CPGB becomes a tale of liberalism or liberal laborism, um, the euro communists. Um, in other words. So yes, um, you know, what a, a new international will look like, I don't know, but it should not be a copy of the third. And I don't think it should be a copy of the second. It, it'll have to look at its, it'll, it'll have to be historically specific, but it has to, has to learn from the first, the second, the third, or for that matter, the completely ineffective so-called fourth. Uh, there was an attempt. We need to learn from everything. But those examples, uh, I think, do tell us uh, something. Um, in terms of tailing the Labour Party, I think Mike's dealt with that. We are not tailing the Labour Party. You know, um, how are we tailing the Labour Party? That's like saying we're tailing the trade unions because I'm a member of, the, uh, of Unite or something like that. No, we're not tailing them. We don't believe in NATO. Don't believe in it. We don't. We fight to abolish NATO. Uh, we don't tail um, EUism, um, uh, 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 nor do we tail Brexit. So I, I agree with you, uh, uh, Ethram, that uh, some uh, on the left undoubtedly do. Mike's already mentioned the CPB, um, but there are others in the past. If you took uh, militant tendency, um, I would certainly say it adapted itself in a chameleon type way to um, laborism with its socialism in one country, its nationalism uh, and all the rest of it. Um, yeah. Um, in terms of the SDF, yeah, I mean, again, it's just worthwhile saying, uh, I haven't come across it, Mike quotes it to me. Um, I've got the um, Marx Engels collected works, I haven't gone and looked for it, but Mike uh, quotes to me, um, a particular occasion of where um, Engels turns around to his comrades on the left and says, well, we should actually urge the working class to vote Tory in order to punish the bastard liberals who take the working class vote for granted. Uh, you know, how serious that was as a suggestion, I haven't got a clue. But tactics should be infinitely flexible. But taking money, yes, they did. And uh, it was obviously notorious at the time. Um, you know, the Tories were hated just like they're hated now uh, by the working class. And in terms of lesser of two evils, the liberals were considered the lesser evil. And so to have 
connived with the Tories. That was what was bad about it. Not standing a candidate, that, that was no problem. It was standing a candidate with the deliberate intention of letting in the Tory. And that's why the Tories paid. Uh, it didn't succeed, uh, by the way. Uh, either way, uh, it blackened uh, Hindman's name. Uh, it blackened the name of uh, SDF. It was a stupid thing to do. I don't know how much money he had, but 50 quid even then. Surely, uh, Henry, you should have sold yourself. No, I don't mean it should have sold himself and more. No. Um, in terms of what Mike was finally saying in terms of left unity and all the rest of it, all I would say is that timing is everything. And, um, you know, we could uh, make it a permanent call uh, for a second go at the Socialist Alliance, and therefore it has no impact. You know, if you, you just bang on on the same thing again and again and again, initiatives mean sparking people out of their complacency, and they ha it has to have some chance of success. Uh, that would be the point. So we don't know when, where, at the moment, um, we, you would make such an initiative. Clearly, we would uh, at some point, but again, on the basis of an advanced program, not a, a, a semi-laborite program. But as we fought for in the Socialist Alliance, that in British conditions, at the very, very least, requires a twin track strategy or twin, twin track approach. You cannot ignore the Labour Party. And what we've been saying to the left uh, throughout is you need to take the Labour Party seriously. So that might mean doing electoral deals, um, presenting Labour candidates with some minimum platform. And I do mean minimum in, in, this, in that respect, in the common or garden accepted sense of the word, but it can also mean being in the Labour Party. What it doesn't mean, though, is putting all your eggs in the Labour Party basket. And as I said, it, you know, it's quite conceivable. I agree with Mike. It's quite conceivable in this historical period that the Labour Party goes through a pasokification um, or at the very least an SDPification. Uh, the, the unions are hived off or whatever, whatever. We don't know. Uh, all I would say uh, to finish is we are still at the primitive stage. Uh, we are still in the battle um, for the vanguard. And uh, until uh, you win that battle, um, it, it's farcical. And I agree with the Peter's remarks that, you know, a left that can't even talk about the rest of the left um i'm not saying it's totally useless um but uh yeah you need to deal with the rest of the left and we need to deal with how how has the left ended up as it's ended up and how can it go forward you it, you cannot uh, do that without actually addressing and intervening and encouraging the left to fuse but also split we've got to have a situation of where the control regimes of charlie kimber um, and Hannah Sell are overthrown and uh, the membership uh, think, organize and start to move and, uh, and assume their actual important stature as uh, leaders in the working class uh, movement. That's it. Okay, thanks, Jack. Um, I guess we are at 12.30. I guess we can overrun slightly, maybe, because of the late start. I've got Jim Cook, who wants to come back um, and say a few words. But if anyone else would like to make any final comments for a minute or so, then uh, do so. Indicate now, please. OK, uh, Jim Cook, please. Yeah, sorry, I don't want to drag it on too long, but things came to mind. So I put my name forward a while ago. Um, but. In the Workers' Revolutionary Party, the last few years when I was there, I was quite unhappy. Uh, but I was a printer on the daily paper. And what kept me going was the loyalty to the comrades I was working with. And I think that apply, that must apply to a, a lot of, uh, um, of these groups. I mean, what Jack was saying about the indifference to other groups. Yeah, it's like you're in your own little world and the others don't exist. And... To leave is, 
I, I, I was in a, a branch and there was a couple left the SWP and they were in the branch that I was secretary to. And I was told centrally that uh, they were taking the paper. I said, they're, they're going to be ex SWP. They're going to be pretty demoralized. So we won't get much use out of them. But we might get some money out of them uh, because of the guilt factor. Um, and the thing is about the CPGB, I think, is there is something else. And it's not a recruiting party. It's not saying to SWP people, leave the SWP and come and join the CPGB. But there is something else. And there is wide discussion on all sorts of things and uh, letters and articles disagreeing and so on. Uh, what Mike was saying about loyalists to the state, it just struck me, uh, I, as I recall, uh, Ed Miliband was saying that uh, although he was opposed to the invasion of uh, Iraq, he thought we should show loyalty to the lads who masses who were there. A, a, a vague memory from some years ago. Um, also in the Labour Party, uh, Jack was saying about lots of Marxists in all sorts of groups. That's, that's true. And I think one of the things about the, the various Marxists in the Labour Party who joined to uh, vote for Corbyn is that they're nothing like as uh, disgusted and demoralised as, as the people who, the, who, who thought, ah, oh, Corbyn's the answer sort of thing. There's, a, there's an element of we've seen it before and we'll keep on plodding on anyway. That's it. Thanks. All right, thanks, Jim. Uh, is there anyone else that would like to speak now? I've got no one else down on the list or anything like that. Any final comments? No? Okay. Uh, Jack, would you like to come back for a second or? Okay, so that's that. Um, so uh, that was pretty lively, interesting talk. Um, I'd just like to remind comrades that uh, this afternoon we have our second session. Uh, this will be Marcel van der Linden uh, speaking under the title, Workers and Revolutions, a Historical Paradox. That will be at 4.30. Um, hopefully we'll see you there. Okay, um, and that's it. So thank you very much. Okay, bye-bye. <laughs> Thanks, Dan.